just by the camera ge the relative camera geometry. But there are other types of uh, constraints which we might call soft constraints. Uh, one is similarity, which says that pixels in the left image should look about like the pixels in the right image if you have the right match. Uniqueness says that there's up to no more than one match of a left pixel in the right image. Ordering says if pixels go A, B, C in the left image, they go A, B, C in the right. And disparity gradient is limited. That means that the depth doesn't change too quickly. We'll talk about some of these today, but what we're going to start with is similarity. Similarity essentially saying that the image patch from the left should match the image patch from the right. So to find matches in the image pair, we're going to assume, first of all, that most points that are visible in one view are also going to be visible in the other, so we'll go looking for them, and that the image regions for the matches are similar in appearance. So here's how we're going to do the dense correspondence, and dense correspondence meaning we're finding a match everywhere. For every pixel, let's say in the left image, and we're going to take a little window around that pixel, we're going to compare it with every pixel slash window in the right image, and we're going to just pick the position that is either the most similar or the least dissimilar. And that best match, that's what we're going to assume is our corresponding point. So here's a very simple illustration. So I have a scan line across both images. And we're assuming uh, parallel scan lines for now. And I've got my window in my left image. And I'm going to compare it to a bunch of windows in my right image. And the matching cost is computed everywhere. And so this is just a, not, a notional uh, description of what the matching cost is a function of disparity, so how far off I am from the, the first match. And of course, the idea is, well, we're going to pick the value that has the best score. So I might use something called sum of square differences, which is the sum of the square differences. Wasn't that a surprise? No. What we do is you take the two pixel windows, you overlap them, you subtract them, you square the differences, and then you sum them up. So that would be a measure, and that's why at the top it says dissimilarity. Now, sometimes, let's suppose one image was a little bit brighter than the other image. You know, for some reason the gains weren't set so well on the camera. If I just do direct subtraction, even if the match is exactly the right place, um, because of that scaling of the intensity, I'm going to get square difference error, and it might not lead me to get to the best match. Now, we've already talked about how to eliminate the problem of scaling. Remember, we talked about doing normalized correlation, where we scale the value of the window so it has the same uh, standard deviation. So you could do that here, too. You could take your window and slide it across doing normalized correlation instead of sum of square differences. And that's actually a similarity constraint. All right, let's try to do this in code. I want you to write a function, find best match, that takes two arguments, an image patch and a strip, which is basically the same height as the patch, but has a width equal to that of the image. Your function should return the x-coordinate where the patch is found in the strip. Here is some test code. Let's load up two images from a stereo pair, left and right. This is the left image, and here is the right one. If I switch between the two, you can see some key elements moving. Alright, let's convert these to grayscale double type and scale them down to 0, 1 range. Here are the grayscale versions, left and right. OK, let's define the location and size for the patch we want to match. Let us extract this from the left image. Here's what the patch looks like. Using the patch specifications, let's extract a strip from the right image. Note that here, since we want to go across the width of the image, we select all the columns. And here's the strip from the right image. Once you have implemented your function, call it by passing in patch left and strip right. You should be able to use the best x coordinate found to extract a patch from the right image. Go ahead and give it a shot. Let's use sum of squared differences to find the best match. Let's initialize a couple of variables we'll need. And then let's run through the strip, placing the patch at every valid location. We extract a second patch of the same size from the strip at each location. And then compute the sum of squared differences. And keep track of the x-coordinate that gave us the minimum difference. And that's about it. Let's see how it works. OK, so the best x-coordinate found was 145. The top patch is from the left image. Here's the strip from the right image you saw earlier. 
and the bottom patch has been extracted from the right image. Notice that the appearance of the top of the house has changed a little bit, but our algorithm is still able to find it correctly. Now instead of using sum of square differences, you could have also used cross correlation. Feel free to try out alternate methods. All right, so let's continue looking at this correspondence problem a little bit more. Here we have two images. This is courtesy of Andrew Zisserman. And we've got an epipolar line, and again, we've got horizontal epipolar lines. So here we have uh, both scan lines, left and right image, and a plot of the intensity profiles. And of course, they're going to look pretty similar because there should be matches along the way. But, you know, there are slight differences in, in uh, exactly what the profiles look like. There's a little bit of noise. And there also might be some ambiguity, so finding where you match over here might be uh, challenging over there. So we're going to look at this a little bit more carefully. We've pulled out a window on the left, and we're going to slide that along uh, the epipolar line, uh, that window on the right. All right, let's take a look at a particular window. So I'm showing you the two little bands that are sort of the height of the window. And from the left image band, we're going to pull out a particular point. All right, so here's this point and its window that's associated with it. So that means we have to pull out the right band that's the same, it's the epipolar band, if you will. It's the epipolar line, but with the window height. And we're going to slide that window from the left across the right band. And if we do that, and we were doing, say, cross-correlation, well, you would see this nice high peak right where the thing is supposed to match. So the window was picked sort of between these two dark squares here, and of course the best match is right between these two dark squares, just like you would expect. The problem, of course, is we put a window over a nice, Essentially, in fact, it looks a lot like a surveyor's target of uh, black squares and white squares. What happens if our window falls over this area on the left image band that's pretty textureless? I mean, there's some variation in intensity. It's a little hard to see here. Now, if I correlate that with the right band, what do I get? Well, I see a result that looks like this, okay? And, of course, the question is, Where's the match? Because you notice before I had a nice strong match above that 0.5 value. Now I get multiple matches, and I know that the match is supposed to be somewhere where the question marks are, but it would be pretty hard to justify picking that one uh, over any others. So how could we fix this? Well, our problem, of course, is that the window was so small that it didn't catch any sort of significant texture. So which regions in this image do you think are good for stereo matching? Mark the checkbox next to each suitable window. Let's assume that our stereo setup has coplanar image planes and that the epipolar lines are horizontal. You've seen two of these already. The one with two black corners jutting in turned out to have a very strong match. And we saw that this area on the wall was essentially featureless. Similarly, any region that is too bright or too dark has too little information to be useful. Also, regions that only have horizontal edges going through them, like this or this one, are not useful in our stereo setup. This is because they could result in multiple matches along the epipolar line. Okay then, which ones are good? Anything with a fairly distinct corner works. So do regions with distinct vertical boundaries. If you consider the epipolar lines going through them, you'll see that there is no other region in the image along that line which matches the region. You could say, well, instead of using small windows, use a slightly bigger window. So there's this question of how should we pick the window size? And just like when we were talking about scale, there's not going to be any easy answer. Here's an example of uh, another stereo pair. I'm only showing you the left. So if I do a sliding uh, window stereo, well, for a small window size, um, well, gee, I, I get the branches pretty well of the tree, but you'll notice there is all this, um, I think the technical word is crap, uh, all over everywhere else. That is, uh, I, you know, this is a disparity image, and, and my ground should be going from near to far, uh, and there shouldn't be all this junk all over it. So what do I do? Well, obviously, because of noise and things, I need to make my window bigger to get a more robust match. So if I make my window bigger, I get this nice ground pattern here, right? You can see that it goes from near to far, okay? And the trees back here are farther away. But notice what happens to the tree branches there, okay? The window is too big, and when you put it over a branch, it gets both the branch and the background and doesn't know what to do. Just as I said earlier in this course, scale is always an issue. There's no magic answer. 
I want to talk just a little bit about two of these other uh, constraints that we talked about for the correspondence problem. And I can talk a lot about them, just give you some insight. One is uniqueness and the other is ordering. So uniqueness says that there's no more than one match in the right image for every point in the left and vice versa, same thing. Okay. So why does it say no more than one? Shouldn't it be exactly one? Well, no. The problem is occlusion, and that's illustrated here. Let's suppose I have a green bar in front of a red bar. All right. So here's my left image, and here's my right image. And these are the pixels being seen in my left image, and these are the pixels being seen in my right image. All right. You'll notice I have two red ones here, then two green, then a red. And here I have a red, two green, and two red. And the problem is that these pixels are occluded. And what we mean by occluded is that they're only visible, sometimes they're called half occluded, because this pixel is only visible in the left image, and this pixel is only visible in the right image, right there. Okay? This happens at occlusion edges. So if I hold it like this, so if Megan, if I ask Megan to close her left eye, your other left, uh, uh, she can see, she can't see this thing with her left eye, but if I ask her to change her other one, she can see it with the right eye. So th the tip of this finger is only visible in, in one of her eyes. So that's, that's why you don't have uh, necessarily uh, a unique solution uh, that every pixel is matched in every, um, in every frame. The ordering constraint basically says that if I've got pixels in my left image that go ABC, they're going to appear in the same order ABC in my right image. And that's typically what happens when I look at a single solid surface. So when is this violated? Well, duh. When I'm not looking at a single solid surface. That's SSS. That's pretty cool. So what's not a single solid surface? Well, a couple things. First of all, we could be not solid. Now, what does it mean to be not solid? Well, suppose you have a surface that's transparent that has some markings on it. Okay, so here we have this, suppose this is a transparent surface, all right, and we can see these points, all right. Well, if they're transparent, it would go A, B, C in that order, but over here, it would go C, A, B, all right, and that's just because we can see through the surface. Well, that's really weird, and that almost never happens. What happens much more often is what's sometimes called the pen, floating pen, I forget, whatever it's called. Basically, if I've got a narrow occluding surface, and you can actually do the simple experiment, having nothing to do with stereo, of put your two fingers, one right in front of the other, and in your left eye, this finger is to the left of this, but in your right eye, the other finger is to the left of this. So it swaps. So if you're a stereo algorithm that's trying to figure out how to do the match, uh, that's a problem. I will tell you that current stereo, stereo algorithms do a lot of work to handle the occlusion problem because that happens all the time because if I've got one edge of, a, of an object in front of another object there are going to be pixels that are visible in one eye or one camera and not the other. Current stereo algorithms are not so great on violations of the ordering constraint because um, it's a various scale problem etc. Uh, so that's just sort of where the state of the art is. Let's try to implement a very simple approach for matching corresponding regions from two image strips. First, recall the find best match problem. Given an image patch and a strip, your task was to find the best X location for the patch in the strip. You are free to use this reference implementation or roll your own. Now, your task is to match two strips. You are given the two strips, left and right, as well as a block size B. Note that you are only to consider whole, non-overlapping blocks. This means if your strip is 640 wide and the block size is 100, then you only have 6 whole blocks. The last 40 columns of the strips are unused. Return a vector of disparity values, one for each block. Alright, here's some code to test with. We use the same pair of flower images as before and extract a strip from each image. The top one here is from the left image and the bottom one from the right. Now we should be able to call your function by passing in the two strips and the block size. So, how do you go about solving this? Let's first figure out what the number of blocks should be. 
Since we are only interested in whole blocks, we use the floor function to round off. Okay, now initialize disparity as a row vector. For each block,